Record to the iCloud. Yes. I have never done this before. <clears throat> it is now 10 o'clock. Hopefully, Liz Stephonics is going to show up in a minute. Is there? Do you have a number for her office? Uh, Laura, Laura, Call? called her. Laura called her so she could. If she doesn't I gave her Meg's number okay. if she was having any difficulty with the internet or okay, with the cool. Zoom call. Good. Do you have Thank your you. phone handy, Meg? Right there. Thank you. <clears throat> the only person who called me was move on. <laughs> <clears throat> Do we have a more informal agenda or priorities of the dozens of bills we might discuss? Yes, we, that's, what we, that's what we discussed at our strategy meeting. Um, she, she supports all of them. Cool. So we're going to zip through them quickly and we're going to get her to discuss a couple that she is, she's introducing. Laura, do I have the right word? Is she introducing the bills? Sponsoring. 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 Thank you. I couldn't think what the word was. <clears throat> she's sponsoring the ETA and the uh, community solar. Cool. <clears throat> Good question. <laughs> now I get twitchy. <laughs> well, it's only two minutes after the hour. Give her a break. I know, but I still get twitchy. <laughs> if she's not here in two or three days, I think we need to call this off. <laughs> <laughs> two or three days? <laughs> You're a more patient human than I am, Diane. <laughs> <clears throat> We, we had an experiment, Alan and I, and discovered that if you dump a glass of water on your computer, it kills it. So in case anybody wants to try that experiment, you don't have to, because we have done it for you. It applies to coffee and wine also. That would be worse. That would be worse, because then you have not just water, but sugar and stuff. Liz is there. Liz, hang on. Liz is coming yes. up. All right. Cool. <clears throat> Hi, Liz. Hello, Senator. How is everybody? We're all good. We're all happy to see you. Healthy. Good. Morning. Morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Meg. I'm going to run the run the meeting. Okay. We're all, going to, we're all going to briefly introduce ourselves, like 20 seconds worth of introducing ourselves, and then we're going to move along. Um, I'm Meg Meltz. I've been a member of. Uh, we take our democracy almost since it started, and I'm delighted to see you. Um, Alan, want to speak for 20 seconds? <laughs> yeah, I'm Alan Sindelar. Um, I live outside of Madrid, um, that, and I've been a member of Retake for a number of years. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Beth, would you like to? Hi, Liz. I'm Beth and Bob Detweiler from Oshara Village. Good to see you. Hey. Great. Karen? Hey. I'm uh, from Cerrillos, a retired lawyer, and living here permanently now for about three years. And coming from Oregon, I just want to say I really appreciate your work on end-of-life issues, because I know how well it works up there. And thank you for that. Good. Uh, Laura? I'm Laura Rydell, and I'm from Santa Fe. I've been a member of Retake Our Democracy and Think New Mexico. Terrific. Nice Thank to meet you, Liz. Thank you. Diane? I'm Diane Martin. I lived in uh, Alto, New Mexico, or north of the rich part, for 10 years. Uh, I've been visiting for 30 years. My great-grandmother came from Tres Piedras. Mm -hmm. I've been a voter for Liz. Uh, and contributed a little bit to uh, a little bit to our campaigns and stuff. Uh, and I've been very lucky to meet you both in Ruidoso and in Senate meeting chambers. Thank you for joining Good. us. Thank you. Great. Jude? I'm Jude Anderson. I live in Rancho Viejo in Santa Fe. And um, been here for four years, retired from the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. And I too want to thank you for your work in the uh, proposed end-of-life options legislation. 
I know it's year after year, but maybe this will be the year. <laughs> it might. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks, Jude. Joyce? Hi, Liz. I'm Joyce Victor. I live in El Dorado, and I think that's all I'll say right now. I, I have been um, kind of on the fringes of Retake Our Democracy um, with occasional uh, uh, strong interest in certain things and great respect for this organization. Thank you, Joyce. Sunflower? Sunflower, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Sunflower. Um, I also have a legal name. Which... Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Oops. Oops, that didn't, that didn't come over. I couldn't hear you. I'm not muted. Sunflower, where are you from? Um, I live in um, Canyoncito, and Great. I've lived in this area for 30 years, and I'm a retake person and an end-of-life options person, and a big fan of Liz Stefanik's. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Look at those 15-second intros. That was excellent. Um, so what we want to do, <clears throat> Senator, is to find out what where you might need some help find out what exactly you're interested in i think we we know that you already support all the bills but i'd like to run through them quickly to see if we have anything to contribute or you have anything to tell us about them sure now let me just interject a minute Please. everybody you should just call me liz the only time the senator is really formal is when we're in the capital or doing um capital business so Otherwise, you know, I just live in the neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we'd like to specifically ask you to talk about the ETA that you're, you're supporting, that you're sponsoring, and ways we can help. And that's why we're here. Okay. Um, so you want me to start with the ETA? Um, yeah, that would be great. And then I was going to share the screen, and we can just look at, look at all the different bills. Maybe okay, so I'm gonna share, I'm gonna um, share it right away. Actually, there are three. There are three reasons, or three purposes of amending the um, Energy Transition Act, and I want to let everyone know we are not touching the goals, the renewable energy goals. We are not touching those. We support those. We really want those to be successful. We are not touching the securitization and we are not touching the um, funds that have been set up to retrain those people who are going to be losing jobs. What we are doing is we're giving the PRC, the Public Regulation Commission, their authority back to regulate and to determine uh, fees and rates Secondly, we're taking away the 100% uh, burden that was placed on ratepayers. And third, we're standardizing the hearing process uh, so that it's not um, accelerated to 10 days. It's the same as all their other rate cases, which is 30 days. Sorry, let me turn this off. Liz, could you repeat the last one? Yes, um, the last the last uh, big uh, change in the bill is simply changing the hearing period from 10 days to 30 days for decision making, which is what it is for all the other uh, rate cases that the PRC has. So we are standardizing uh, the hearing periods we are giving authority back to the PRC uh, to rule on this case, like every other case, and we are taking away the 100% and letting the PRC determine that. Now, the reason this is important is there is some ambiguous language at the end of the bill, the old bill, that uh, could relate to the closing of a nuclear plant. Yeah. And of the nuclear plant would be far more expensive. 
than even what we're talking about now. Now, um, there, is a, there is a great deal of debate about this. So when the bill was first came through in, it wasn't the first time because what we were doing in 2019 is amending the Energy Transition Act. But several legislators were not comfortable with the way this played out. And some of us went, wait a minute, 100% burden on the ratepayers? That was my biggest issue. First one. Mm -hmm. was, why are we taking away the authority from the PRC? Now, for those of you who have lived here a long time, you probably know that I ran for the PRC when it was first created, when we combined um, the Corporation Commission and the uh, Public Utilities Commission. My real interest at the time was healthcare and the health uh, insurance was under that. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna be uh, a consumer advocate if I run for this. So that was many years ago. And uh, anyway, I believe the PRC, their elected body, they should have their authority. The other issue that I think many of us had was we don't usually bail out an energy company, a utility company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all kind of looked at each other, Republicans and Democrats, and went, is this really what we want to do? Now, I think that what happened, and I was not on the inside, I think that what happened is the groups that worked really hard on this, getting it passed, that was their compromise with the utility company in order to get the renewable energy goals set in statute. So as we go forward with this bill, we cannot let anybody touch those renewable energy goals. We only, you know, we're being very limited, but when you introduce a bill, you are open to lots of amendments. And what we as sponsors have to stress to everybody is we're not doing this to, to uh, change the bill. We're really doing this to protect the ratepayers. So that's the reason um, I'm involved with this. I was going to be the um, main sponsor, but it is assumed uh, until it doesn't happen that I'll be the chair of the Senate Conservation Committee. So in some ways, I will have more control over running the hearing on this bill uh, as the chair of the committee versus presenting the, the bill. The other issue is that uh, Bill Tallman and I were going to do this together, and he still is on the bill. And then we have a couple of attorneys in the Senate and a couple of attorneys from outside groups who want to argue about this. So I engaged the help of Antoinette Cedillo Lopez, who's in the Senate, and she is a retired law school professor. And she is one of the best in standing up to uh, legal arguments. And in fact, we're going to be, the three of us are doing a presentation to an Albuquerque Unitarian Fellowship group this Sunday on the same topic. Um, so anyway, that's that bill. And so do you want to take questions after each bill or you want to keep going? Um, well, this, this is a particularly complex and important bill. So if people yes. have questions, I think it's reasonable for them to ask them. Okay. Um, people are muted, so, um, and I can't see everybody right now. Laura? Um, Liz, what are the objections to this bill? Well, the objections, number one, <laughs> number one, um, one of the groups at, uh, on the other side says that we don't understand the bill. And number two, they're saying that we are threatening the securitization. And number three, they're saying that we're going to be uh, eroding the um, fund that trains, retrains those people who have lost their jobs. Now, as I said, we are not doing anything with securitization. Secu now, I hope everybody understands, securitization is where you sell bonds 
hopefully at a low interest rate, to pay out over 25 or 30 years, sometimes it's 20, 25, 30 years, to pay down a debt. Now, it was assumed when this bill was passed in 2019 that the interest rate would be uh, very low, like maybe one and a half to 2%. Because of what's happened with the economy, it is now in the 3% or higher range for the securitization. While people have been told at, in 2019 that their bills would go down six or seven dollars a month for the duration of these bonds, it is not, there is now a actuarial study that says your PM bill could go up six or seven dollars a month for the next 25 to 30 years. Now, I have already received a call from one of my constituents up in uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, a senior citizen. And this last bill was double from PM. And he didn't understand why. And he tried to talk to his neighbors about it. And some of them had high bills, like double, and some of them didn't. So Senator, the Senator-elect Brenda McKenna, who's down in the, I think she's the Bernalillo Corrales area. Anyway, she indicated that she's been contacted by constituents whose PM bills have gone up. Now, it is hard for me to tell because my PM bill is tied into a solar field that we put in, my partner and I put in about um, 15 years ago. So, what others do just from PM. Now, did I answer your question? Oh, about, up, up, there was one other thing. Okay, so they thought that we were going to threaten the securitization. They thought that the, re, you know, basically, and this is fair, uh, the original sponsors are afraid that there will be an attack on the renewable energy goals. And we just have to work very hard to say, no, you can't change that part. We are only coming in with this very limited change. But once you open up any bill, it is fair game for change. Where is the opposition coming from? Is it the leadership? Is it the Republicans? Is it people up in the uh, Northwest corner of the state? Can you give me no. an idea? It is really, um, it's sad to say it's some of the environmental advocacy groups. Hmm. Uh, in fact, uh, they've been pretty uh, blatant about it, but the Sierra Club has really uh, put out some emails that have said that we are misguided in doing this bill, and they've done some meetings about it. So... Uh, they, of course, are aligned with some other environmental groups, but it's really the Sierra Club that is putting out publicly the emails and having Zooms about it, et cetera. We do intend to have uh, an ETA Zoom this next Thursday, I believe it's at one o'clock from one to two, with the three sponsors and with new energy economy and all the there's about a dozen groups who have signed on to support this now so uh that also that zoom will be advertised and be public and we'll make sure retake gets all the information so we can put it out is there anything specifically that retake retake can do to help get this bill passed well i think that if you help focus the discussion on protecting the goals, but helping the ratepayers, um, you know, protecting the energy goals, the renewable energy goals, but but um, let's help the ratepayers. I think that's my main intent in uh, getting behind this. Thank you. 
So you have no idea why those bills went up, the, the P&M bills that people complained about. You Not yet. Know. I've referred them, you know, P&M is uh, regulated by the PRC. And so Commissioner PRC, Commissioner Joe Manestis is the new commissioner for the North. And so I have referred this constituent of mine to his constituent services person. So I can't really mm -hmm. say, I don't know. Right. Um, so the other bill you're uh, sponsoring is um, is the community solar. Um, May yes. can I ask yeah. one question of Liz first? Sure, Joy. Uh, as a as a longtime environmentalist, I you know I do you think that the Sierra Club is misunderstanding or I mean. Is there any way to end up working with them instead of being on opposite poles? Because it, it, it puts a kind of bind to right. uh, that might not be necessary. I totally agree with you. And the Sierra Club has always been a supporter of mine. Um, they're kind of stepping back right now, but they know that I will be good on every other bill they have. Um, we as they have looked at our issues, specifically the ambiguous language about the nuclear, they have now gone back. Jason Marks is their attorney. He has filed an amendment to one of the uh, PRC rulings for uh, clarification about the nuclear shutdown. And so there is some, there is a moving to the middle on this. Uh, you know, we might find that the Sierra Club will totally embrace it. And we might find that some of it will just be picked up by the PRC, but the PRC really needs their authority back in order to address some of these issues. So I, Joyce, I hope, I hope that there is a, a, a coming to the middle, but I also believe that almost every bill we pass can be improved. <clears throat> Thanks, that's all cheering to hear. Um, so the other bill you're sponsoring is community solar. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Oh, sure, that? Um, absolutely. We had um, last year during the short session, uh, there was an effort to pass the community solar again. Uh, Representative Patricia Redwell Caballero, and then uh, on my side, mm -hmm. me, and Bill Souls is very interested in this as well, and several other senators. But what happened is I was able to pass a memorial in the last days of, this, of the short session saying, let's set up a work group, um, a task force of all the interested parties and work on this over the summer. So the, some of the environmental groups uh, put up some money and uh, it was given to a neutral entity to hire a facilitator. And Paul Biederman was hired uh, or put on contract to uh, run the task force and to write a report about the results. When we started the task force, the invitation was wide open to everybody. And in fact, um, I know a couple of retake uh, members participated. Uh, Joyce Bogosian, who lives over in Rancho Viejo, was one of them. And uh, we had, at the very first meeting, we had over 90 people attend. But then what we did is we set up the meetings for two hours every other week. So the group whittled itself down to about 60 people. And we ran this, uh, we did surveys. We had educational pieces at the beginning of every meeting. Uh, some of them were from the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory that's up in Colorado. 
they uh, did a presentation on what community solar is. A lot of people don't understand about the um, how the lines are transmitted. This is not rooftop solar. This is creating a uh, community solar garden, a community solar field where the energy is then a membership. And a good uh, example of this is the uh, solar fields up in, uh, Kit, uh, in Taos through Kit Carson Electric Co-op. So we have this study that was in print and we can make that available to you. But the small working group is Vote Solar, uh, Conservation Voters, um, the Sierra Club, the Coalition for Solar Communities, uh, all the Native American tribes are represented uh, by a uh, and by a person who works with the All Indian Council. And so there's a group of like uh, six people who have pulled out all the commonalities, all the compromises, all the agreements from the working group that we are now putting into the bill. So while, while the bill might not be exactly how you or I in, envisioned it, we are trying to be respectful of the process over the entire summer. So the bill will um, have the support or at least neutrality from the electric co-ops because we allowed them to opt in. We don't think the IOUs, the investor owned utilities will ever get on board because what it's really doing is allowing uh, smaller groups to organize their energy and they would rather control that. So from the, um, there might be some dog barking in a minute. Um, so from that work group, uh, we are still, we have a draft into uh, legislative council, but we have come up with more amendments. And so we're not ready to show it to the public or to pre-file it. The ETA is pre-filed under uh, Tallman, but the community solar is not quite ready. The community solar bill will be sponsored by myself, uh, Representative uh, Patricia Royball Caballero, Representative Andrea Romero, and we're trying to get uh, Senator Bill Souls on the bill so that uh, we're negotiating with him so that he will not have his own separate community solar bill. So we're trying to find out what his differences are with our bill. The bill would allow, oh, we are also going to establish a LMI, low and moderate income fund to assist low income people to become a su subscriber. And we are following the pattern of some other states that have done this. Uh, it, there's been the argument that if you are a subscriber to this and you are paying, that you shouldn't be burdened with paying for the low income subscriber. Well, we wanna make sure then if that's the case that we have some other fund and that actually has to be put into state law because state law doesn't just allow you to collect uh, money from foundations or other places to uh, fund things. You have to put it into the state law to allow it. Any questions anybody has for, for Liz? <laughs> Liz? <clears throat> Um, let's zip through our 15 bills, 14 bills. Okay. The ARA. Um, um, abortion decriminalization, I doubt that we have anything to discuss. I mean, it's like. Well, we have quite a few new members of the Senate. We have uh, 10 
No, wait, is that right? Seven. Mm -hmm. uh, new uh, four new Republicans. Three, four new Republicans won't uh, support decriminalization, but the all the new Democrats will. So with its, we have 27 Democrats. Uh, we might lose one or two, but it won't be it, it won't be as bad as last time. In the House, I'm not as familiar with the House. So you feel like it will probably pass. Is that what you're saying? I am thinking it will probably pass. Senator Worth and Senator Linda Lopez are going to be the sponsors in the Senate. Okay. Uh, Health Security Act. Now there's something complex. Okay, so many people, uh, many people support the Health Security Act, including myself. The one thing that I think will make it not happen this year is the cost associated with it. There is a several million dollar cost to setting it up because the cost savings would not come for three to five years after. Now, while the budget is not in the tank, it's flat. So coming up with extra, a few extra billion dollars to set this up, I don't think is gonna happen. There has already been a study. There have already been experts who have said, Here's how you do it. Here's what you're going to need in terms of cost of setting it up. Now, I do believe many legislators on the Democratic side do support it. So it might actually get through committees and down to the Senate floor. Now, one thing I should talk about, because we haven't talked about this yet, you know, the entire session is going to be virtual. No public are going to be allowed inside the Senate or the, or the Capitol. So on the Senate side, we have a schedule that's been proposed. It's not set in stone, but it's, it's a framework. The framework is that the first week we would be on the floor of the Senate in order to introduce bills, to get organized into committees. Then the next two weeks, we would be in virtual committees, which means that we would be doing these committees through Zoom. And uh, if I'm chair of conservation, I would have a committee secretary like I usually do but I would have a Zoom master. And that Zoom master would be the person who would let in um, witnesses, who would let in speakers, et cetera. And that's expected to go on for two weeks. Then we go back to the floor of the Senate to vote on bills that have passed and to introduce final bills because halfway through the session is the deadline for introducing bills. So one week on the floor, two weeks in virtual committees, one week back on the floor, and then back to committees, and then towards the end of the 60 days back on the floor. So that's the Senate's um, proposed schedule right now. So you asked the question, I'm sorry, do you remember the question, <laughs> which took me, which took me to this uh, dialogue? Let's see. Uh, sorry. Okay, about the abortion. Okay, so we were talking about decriminalizing abortion, and or the Health Security Act, and I was saying that it might get to the floor, but then if it passed the floor and it goes to the House, it might languish in some of the House committees if the House still is working on their own bills. Usually, now this is different year, but usually we take care of all of our own bills before we start working on the bills of the other House. So that's where it could get hung up, the Health Security Act. 
that's what I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what, what we're really looking for, I mean, I love hearing all this stuff. I could have, have you talk all day, but you probably would run out of energy. Um, but what we really want to know is how can we help? But if there's anything that you think of while you go that we can contribute in the way of advocating for your, for anything, um, say it and we'll. Well, no, okay. So legis legislators will be receiving um, uh, mail, actually physical mail twice a day. And our secretaries will be working from their own homes, but our phones will be forwarded to them so that they will be letting us know about phone calls that come in. And I will be checking my emails and my secretary will be checking my emails. So, you know, one of the, as soon as you find out somebody's supportive, thank them for being supportive and, and please stick to their guns about it. But if somebody's not supportive, they need some persuasion. Now the next bill on public banking is gonna, some people are gonna need persuading. Yep. The um, independent and small banks have already sent out information to all of us saying there is no need public bank and that a public bank would hurt the small banks of the state. Now, I have met with the public banking um, planning group a couple of times over the past few years. And one of the items I suggested to them was that if they would focus on a public bank for cannabis um, finances, that that is something that all the community banks aren't allowed to do. And so I and a few other legislators have brought this up. Um, I don't know what the group is planning to do. I, when I get negative stuff about public banking, I just pass it on to the planning group so that they know what's being talked about. Okay. So, so I, I think that that's, I think you're going to see a divided democratic caucus on public banking. Yeah, it makes sense because I don't understand it. So we need any any kind of um, education we can do, we'd be delighted to. <clears throat> well, it's also about uh, how do you reassure a business entity in the state that they're going to be protected and that they won't have funds taken away from it. Local choice energy is mm -hmm. um, your thing. Pardon? And um, Senator Steinborn and others are really in, interested in this. And um, there's some overlap with community seller, but it's a broader bill than that. It really allows consumers to say, I want to hook up with this co-op. I want to hook up with this utility. I want to hook up with this wind. I want to hook up with this solar. So the local choice energy is a broader bill than community solar. And uh, of course, we hope it passes as well. So does it incorporate in community solar? It would cover community solar. Yeah, it would cover it. it so it's it would be an umbrella bill. And um, I believe Senator Steinborn and Senator, uh, the last I heard, maybe Senator Benny Shindo were going to help with that one. Yeah. Um, the the well, green... Green um, I think this. I think this is a great goal. I think many of us will vote for it. What would happen is it then would go onto a statewide ballot, 
for everyone to vote on. And that will need some major education around the state. Do you see that something maybe we can help with? Because, um, you know, I think sometimes, um, you know, I don't want to say the Republicans are opposed to something, but sometimes when entities or individuals feel threatened by a bill, they go, no, I'm not going to support this. Now, some entities that are going to feel threatened by the Green Amendment are going to be um, cattle and dairy. We, I believe we have very responsible uh, ranchers and farmers in our state, and they're going through uh, really difficult times with the drought. Um, and they're, I think that they are trying to do their best, but I think that they're going to see the Green Amendment as something that is maybe attacking them. So until you, you know, until you get in committee and you hear the committee members talking, you don't really know how it's going to go. Okay, so there's not too much we could talk about right now. There's there's no enforcement in this, right? As as it as it stands, it's just sort of a indication. Well, no, it would it would mean okay. So if a green amendment got into our constitution. That would mean that all of our laws that we pass from the future in the future should be meeting the goals of that Green Amendment. And so it changes the way you do business. Mm -hmm. Just like the Martinez Yazi lawsuit came down, it should change the way we do business in public education, but it hasn't quite yet. But it, you know, that lawsuit basically said you need to put more money into second language. You need to put more money into disabled. You need to put more money into rural areas. You need to put more money into broadband. But uh, getting the money and putting it there is a different story. You have a lawsuit, you have um, a decision, but the follow through is different. Now, if you put the Green Amendment into the state constitution, it gives you a platform and how it, the, all the rest of your bills should be. Um, <clears throat> hi, this is Merle Lefkoff. Can I say something? Sure, Merle. Oh, thank you so much. I used to be chair of the board of the Kavira Coalition a uh -huh. long time ago. Yeah. And um, are you saying, Liz, that um, ranchers and some ranchers and farmers do not appreciate the need for clean air, clean water, and making sure that, that the land is productive? I don't think you're saying that. No, I'm not. But this is a difficult conversation. And when we've sat down with ranchers, uh, both in the past and the present, <laughs> They will always say they are the best stewards of the land. And, and they, so I, I'm wondering how you would approach this um, probability, which I think you're right, that there'll be some question about this because about how it would be interpreted in law later. Well, I, you know, my, I represent uh, parts of six counties and much of my district is rural. And I have farming and ranching. Mm -hmm. Some of the areas that have uh, ranch land have actually turned to uh, wind and solar mm -hmm. and given up ranching because of the drought. Yeah. Uh, and wind and solar is the way for their children to stay involved with the, the home and the land, uh, but not carry on the traditional uh, farming and ranching. So I think um, 
it's a fine line. It, it's offering respect to our farmers and ranchers, but when the industry representative stands up and says, uh, we see this as a direct attack, it's up to the sponsor and their expert witness to explain why it they shouldn't perceive it like that. Now, as goals for our future, as goals for the generations to come, we know it's the right thing to do. And that might be one way of approaching it. Another way um, is when an entity, any entity is hurt, sometimes there's compensation funds. Like if you look at the wolves and if the wolves have um, decimated any uh, uh, cattle or flocks, there's a compensation fund. Uh, but that is put into statute and rule after the fact. So the Green Amendment, you know, it is philosophical. And I don't know, just look at Washington this past week. We saw some major philosophical differences. New Mexico is no different. We have philosophical differences. And while it might be two thirds in agreement, we might have one third or one quarter in disagreement. So if you think of ways to verbalize this and come up with good talking points for retake, I think that'd be great. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. You know, I'm a recovering mediator. So I'm- Well, yes, I, I know that. But here's the other thing you should know. It's not really up to the legislators to convince each other, uh, it's it's there's a line that we're not supposed to push beyond in challenging our colleagues mm -hmm. on how they're going to vote. And so part of it is uh, allowing respect for everyone. If I vote no on somebody. The rule is you don't ask why. And I'm not saying from you, I'm saying from other legislators. Right. right. And so advocates, um, constituents have more, you know, you have the total leeway of what you want to talk about with me. But my colleague sitting right next to me doesn't. Right. Although we saw that crossed in Congress yesterday on <laughs> the last couple I know, I know. I mean, we all get to make speeches in general for everybody. But that's a little bit different than my going to Senator, Senator Shendo sits next to me. I think he's going to move. But, you know, it's different from me going to Senator Shendo saying, you know, why aren't you voting for this? Why aren't you voting for this? Why aren't you excited about this? I'm not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, I really, thanks, I'd really Liz. like to help with this. I've yeah. been I've been working with this for the last thirty five years. <laughs> so well, you know, I think you know if we want to talk about the future, and I said local choice energy was um, an umbrella. The Green uh -huh. Amendment is a bigger umbrella, yeah. and the Green Amendment it would be fantastic. No, it's huge. It truly is huge. It yeah, means a lot of things. And so I am projecting that in the Senate, there are enough votes. Well, okay, remember an amendment takes um, two thirds. So it, it, it'll be close, but I, I think we could pass it in the Senate floor. Wow, great. great. But then you go to the House and you got to count votes there too. And an amendment doesn't have to go to the governor. 
It's just about the votes on the House floor and the Senate floor. Oh, it doesn't have to go to the governor. That's right. Cool. Um, I'm going to move this along if that's all right. Sure. The permanent, permanent fund for early childhood. Uh, um, that will pass. Um, I think the okay. only debate. I think the only debate will be the percentage. Mm -hmm. It's a half a percent, a one percent, whether it's one percent of the interest. Four. Three uh, quarters of a percent. Yeah, I mean, all of, that's that's the debate. Cool. Um, comprehensive, comprehensive tax and rev reform. I don't know if that's even. Uh, yeah. Oh wow. Uh, some people will have bills about this. Uh, this seems to be talked about all the time. And it should happen. Um, in my mind, we should put the progressive tax structure back in place, which means that those people with higher incomes pay more than the people with lower incomes. Uh, we changed that under Governor Bill Richardson. I think we need to put it back. Uh, whether or not we do comprehensive tax reform, I, I will tell you, I should, I should back up. Let me make a couple big statements. You know, the virus and the economy are going to be the main focus of this session the virus and the economy. And if we can't come up with enough ideas to get our economy, all our businesses back up and running, uh, we are gonna be in a sad way for many years, the state. We already have a high level of poverty. We have businesses permanently shutting down. We have people permanently out of work, not just temporarily. So those two issues and i think all these environmental issues are very important but um those two we've been told and over and over again in our caucuses and in all our discussions with our you know big groups of people those are the concerns when are kids getting back to school when are we going to open our businesses when are we going to get our vaccines um so those two issues really kind of override. I think we still have time to do a lot of good work, like the Green Amendment and some others. But I, I just keep in mind that the people of the state want us to fix things. Sometimes we're not good at fixing. Sometimes we are. Thanks okay. saying that, because I, I hadn't thought about that. It's incredibly important. Yeah, exactly. Um, now the working families tax credit, definitely that would help the economy. That would help all our uh, low income people. Then, so do you think it has a good chance of passing? Uh, I think so, yeah. The oil and gas bond increase, um, I think that there is uh, considerable support for that. That might need uh, See, okay, um, we elect our president pro tem on the first day. And technically, it's not until after we on the floor that we elect the pro tem, which should be Mimi Stewart this year. Uh, and Peter Worth is going to stay majority leader. Then she announces who will be on the committee's committee. Well, you go off to the committee's committee, reads off who's going to be chair of what and who's going to be on what committee, and then the committee's committee approves it. And then it, you go back to the floor of the Senate, you read out that committee report, and you get a vote from everybody on that. And that's when you find out who the chair of a committee is and who your members of the committees are. So by the end of the first day, is when you should see the organization of the Senate. Uh, we have four empty chairs of committees in the Senate. So uh, 
probably Meg, you or somebody from Retake should be watching the Zoom all day <laughs> on that first day just to find out what happens. I don't think that, you know, that four new chairs and one of the new chairs is going to be finance. And that's a big deal. Because a lot of our bills have to go through finance for fiscal impact. So um, I believe in that oil and gas bond increase has support in Senate conservation. The Water Governance Reform Act has support. And you know, I, supp I support all of these bills that are on here. So just to let you all know. The paid sick leave, I haven't seen the actual language, but I think that the idea of phasing in, just like we phased in the minimum wage is important because right now we have businesses that aren't even open. We have businesses that are going bankrupt. And to say you now need to do paid leave, that makes sense for the employee, but is there even gonna be a business left? So there needs to be some uh, consideration. Uh, the small loan interest rate cap reduction, that's our um, payday loans, uh, reducing the interest. Uh, I talked about energy transition, marijuana legalization. Okay, I think that there's enough support to pass it. I think the devil is in the details. I think that there's all kinds of issues, whether or not it will be limited in terms of producers and sellers, whether there will be a local option so that cities, towns and counties can say, we're not gonna be involved. And when they say we're not gonna be involved, that means it could go on all around us, but we don't have to do it and then we won't get to participate in the taxes that are collected. Um, the, you know, the whole issue of raising and quality, the number of plants, the number of, uh, as I mentioned, our producers. So I, I think it's going to pass, but the devil's in the details. And so if we have, if we have several marijuana bills, which I have already heard we're going to, um, which ones are going to come out on top? I don't know. The uh, food and ag omnibus bill. Everything in this bill is great. The problem is, I think an omnibus bill covers several different topics. And they would be easier passed if they was broken up into different pieces. It has to do with supporting farmers, ranchers, uh, ag producers. It has to do with hunger, with providing uh, fresh fruits and vegetables to children in schools, to our um, seniors, to supporting our farmers markets, supporting um, year round production. And we've done a really good job on uh, supporting fruits and vegetables, but we have to start thinking about our, our part of agriculture that is meat. Uh, we have had some small efforts in our state. Senator Pinto, who used to, um, some of us on here might be vegetarians, and I apologize if this is offensive, but some of us, eat meat. And we used to have some slaughterhouses and um, production houses here in the state. And Senator uh, Pinto, the deceased Senator John Pinto, his family had all of those. And when he passed away, nobody in the family was interested in continuing those. So right now, our um, livestock is sent out of state for um, slaughter and packaging. And 
if we really want to support our farmers and ranchers, uh, we need to think about all the things that they need. And so we've been doing a great job of supporting uh, our farmers for fruits and vegetables, but we have to expand the thinking with the food and ag omnibus bill. And that's what's in that bill. It's many, many different things. And I am a part of the uh, food task force, the hunger task force that's looking at this. Uh, almost every state agency that deals with food in some way has been involved. Uh, our Department of Agriculture down in at New Mexico State, our Department of Health, our Aging and Long-Term Services, our Public Education Department, and I'm probably missing some. But all the state agencies have been working with advocacy groups, our food banks, our farmers, our ranchers, our dairy farmers. So everybody's, you know, involved in this big working group. It's kind of like the community solar bill. It's, they have this big group working on this as well. And then you go into priority bills. So why don't I stop to take questions because we're almost out of time before I have to go to my next one. Okay. Liz, I have a question on a priority bill. Sure. It's the um, Independent Redistricting Commission. Yes. Do you, uh, first of all, what's your position and do you think it has a, a chance of passing? Okay, so I, it was either last year or the year before I carried um, the Redistricting yes. Commission for the League of Women Voters. And so I do support it. Um, fair Districting is the group that has been, it's a coalition. They have been meeting to talk about their recommendations of um, what should happen with redistricting. If a independent redistricting committee, so I support it. I support the different tenants. Um, Senator Mary Kay Papen, who was the prior pro tem, President Pro Tem, who lost her seat to Senator Carrie Hamblin, um, she appointed some people to the redistricting work group of the legislature. And so once Senator Mimi Stewart is appointed pro tem, she will have to uh, revisit or change those appointments. Okay. So I believe that we, sh I believe that the public and groups that are, uh, really invested in this should be, have the opportunity to work on it together. I do believe that research and polling, which is Brian Sandroff's business, that usually receives the contract to do this. I believe that he is fair and just, and he produces, he doesn't ever tell the groups what to do. He provides the maps. He gets requests of what to create and provides many different scenarios. We used them at the Santa Fe County uh, when we redistricted the county commission seats. And just as an example, when we redistricted the county commission seats, we, the commissioners, actually had a policy discussion to give every commissioner a piece of the city as well as a piece outside the city. So if you looked at our districts, we were like a pie. Uh, a slice of pie and we all, some of us had more of the city, but we all had some of the city and the rest of the county. And those were based upon some of the maps that research and polling provided us as options. So all I'm saying is the contractor is uh, open-minded and fair. It's the people who sit on the commission to make the decisions that you want to have be more independent. Thank you. Other questions? 
So Meg, uh, uh -huh. you should make sure that you give everybody um, my cell phone. I, I, I'll put it in the chat now. I have, I'll give okay. you my cell phone and my personal email, which is what I use every day. Um, sometimes I get too much junk in the legislative one. So um, please copy it and you can always let other people know too. I used to, oh, that's the other thing. I do a newsletter um, and it's for my constituents, but it's gone to wider group. So if you, if you are not in on my newsletter uh, listserv, send me an email or text me and I'll get you on it. I just sent out one yesterday about how five o'clock today is the deadline for uh, mortgage and rental assistance. Yeah. And I had sent it out before by Christmas, but I just wanted to remind people that five o'clock tomorrow night is the deadline. Or tonight, not tomorrow night, sorry. Yes, Joyce. Um, Liz, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the enormous intelligence and experience and breadth of understanding there's that you bring. I mean, and also seeing different points of view without without malice. Um, it's a very, I, I'm very, very, um, I, I really appreciate your time today. And I also really appreciate who you are and the uh, personhood and maturity you bring to the, to the work that you're doing. Uh, well, thank you. We're, we're really lucky. Yeah. Well, I should tell you when I was first in the Senate in the nineties, I was only 42, 43 years old. And uh, one of my constituents up in San Miguel County told me uh, last, you know, a couple years ago, he said, when you were in the Senate before, you didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, I didn't. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joyce. I appreciate that. Well, it's yeah. the, I mean, as an older person, it's, it's that quality of, of those years and of that um, deepening that I, that I feel in your, uh, in how you talk to us today. Thank you. And I, I do want to encourage the next generation though. So uh, as you run into people who are interested in political office uh, that we, you think we should encourage, send them to talk to me. <laughs> That's nice. But. Thank you, Meg. I'm sorry. I do need to go to the next meeting. Oh, I so appreciate all the time Everybody. you gave us. And it's been so interesting. Like I say, we, I could keep you here all day, but yes. I don't get to. Thank you tremendously. Thanks, Thanks Tony. Bye, Liz. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, um, if people want to stay on and discuss any of this, I'm game. If you don't, that's fine, too. Um, um, most people have left. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, I found her statement very powerful about, you know, the reality is that the legislature will need to focus on the virus and the economy and mm -hmm. what that may mean uh, for this year, even though there's a lot of proposed legislation that speaks to our hearts, you know, realistically, what might happen given the current crises, you know, also, um, I wish the legislature, somebody would take up the issue of the, uh, the influence of the alt-right white supremacist group oh, in God. New Mexico, which is, they are becoming more emboldened. And I don't know if that's, I don't know how that gets addressed at the legislative issue, but it's like a crisis happening right in front of our face. And what can we do about it? And what can our leaders do about it here in New Mexico? That's an excellent, that's an excellent question. I, maybe, maybe we can write to her and ask her because um, I, I just can't believe that you can, that anybody can get away with all the lies. I mean, how come when that is not illegal? I'm pretty sure it used to be illegal and now it's not. What happened? 
is there something we can do to make make people accountable for lies? And, yeah, and you know, uh, we know that there were groups at the Roundhouse on, on Tuesday, um, and Retake did put out an excellent alert, but it really focused on masks, as if that was the only legal recourse we could have was these people were not wearing masks. And it's like, well, that's not good. They weren't wearing masks, but they propose they propose far more of a menace than mm -hmm. that. And and how you know how can New Mexico? You know, I feel like our governor has really taken such a strong stance and been excellent on addressing the virus. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is another menace. You know that I would I would love to see that state leadership addressing in some way or other. And maybe it's through gun legislation. I, I don't know what the inroads are, but it's almost like, okay, if we don't take a strong stance on this at the state and federal level, we're, it's just gonna escalate even more, I think. Yeah, yeah and the, it's threatening democracy. We saw it happen. It's absolutely yeah. terrifying. Um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, to me, it's like an elephant in the room. <laughs> Just now, it's you know, given all this, it's it's the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's strong here in New Mexico because yeah. we saw it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, fortunately, in DC, you can't show up with guns, but right. in New Mexico, you can. Right, <laughs> right there is like holy shit. Right, <laughs> and it, it wouldn't it as a result put the roundhouse on constant alert. You know if. Yeah, it's anyway, just to, oh. just to sort of acknowledge yeah. the elephant in the room. <laughs> no, yeah. last, year, last year at the Roundhouse and the year before, it, it really occurred to me how vulnerable we are there. Everybody is there. There's some cops at the doors, but they didn't even make eye contact with every person coming in. And that's like, you know, people came, could come in with backpacks. I just think that they need yeah. more security there. That it's just not okay. I, I love it that it's open like that, but I don't. I if something happened horrible, it really would be terrible. Yeah. 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 So that's part of it too. Well, and I just want to say thank you to Retake for putting that alert out. I wouldn't even have known Tuesday that they were showing up at the Roundhouse if if not for that alert. Right, and they, they yeah, Paul put that out, and he said we really shouldn't even be there because we don't need to be getting into fights with people. That, no, we shouldn't like, be there. Look at those fighters. Look at the group of fighters. Here, man. You know, but at least he did make recommendations. You know, email the governor, leave a message for the governor. He, he had right. some really good recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Okay. I'm Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We'll talk Thank soon. you. Thanks, so, Meg. 3.30 today, there's a meeting with Paul and we'll present some of this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Alan. Mm -hmm.